Eagles Entertainment. Welcome everyone to the Eagles Insider Podcast presented by Lincoln Financial Group. Eagles Insider Dave Spadaro with you on this Monday and we are ready for some Eagles training camp. The NFL and the Players Association coming to agreement last week on a series of protocols designed to begin training camp on time. So this week, ladies and gentlemen, your patience rewarded. We have football and and I am pleased to bring on to talk to us about what the Philadelphia Eagles are doing. Tom Hunkley, he's the director of sports medicine for the Philadelphia Eagles. And uh, Tom, thanks so much for joining. Before we get into the specifics about what's ahead, it's very interesting to me. You get hired in early February, and then all of a sudden there's a pandemic hitting in March. So you've got to move to Philadelphia. You've got to get settled into the job. I mean, what was that whole experience like getting acclimated to the job? And then all of a sudden, by the way, we've got a global pandemic. Yeah, it was pretty quick. Uh, we had, uh, I, w- I was here for a week. I was at the combine for a week. I came back. I had one more week until everything kind of came crashing down. So uh, it was, it was fast. And it's been uh, a lot of people in the organization doing a lot of things uh, t- to help me and, and for us to kind of get the team moving in the right direction for what we needed with this with this pandemic, uh, and then personally, I have to have, thank my wife a lot because uh, she had to deal with homeschooling and selling a house and you know looking online for a house here all at the same time. So uh, she was able to take that stress away from me, and, and that helped a lot just for me to kind of focus on on the team needs and, and the player needs. I know it's been crazy, so thanks so much for your time here. Uh, Tom, I've got a bunch of questions for you. Let's see what we can do here. Uh, I guess, number one, what is kind of the overarching theme of what you and the team have put in place at the Novacare Complex? Yeah, I think the first step is just acknowledge the amount of work that's been done by so many different individuals. I know you're talking to me today, but um, by no means am am I kind of like the mastermind of this. It has been just an incredible uh, collaboration from, uh, you know, Marla Axelrod to Christy Pappel to John Ferrari to Ryan Hummel. Um, and the list just keeps going on and on of, of those individuals that have, you know, not only tried to try to pull it all together, but then, uh, you know, all the others that have gone on to just even try to change, make the changes, do the physical dis- things that we needed to do, um, and, and come up with the protocols that we needed to do as an organization you know, not just waiting for the NFL to just kind of tell us what to do. Uh, and so I think the overarching theme really, uh, Dave, is that it's safety. Every, everything that we've done, all of our measures, all of our protocols, uh, everything that we've put into place has really been geared just to make the environment as safe as possible. You know, for our players, for our coaches, for our staff, um, you know, we knew that eventually we were going to get to this football season and things have to progress you know, somewhat normally, and the players have to be able to do certain things, and the coaches have certain needs, and medically we have to be able to do certain things, and the only way to do it is to try to create as safe as an environment as you can, uh, put all the work in the front end so that really it's just a matter of following the guidelines and the protocols. And Tom, for, for a lot of fans have, have been through the Novacare Complex, and it's a beautiful building. It's a wonderful building. We all love working there. It's also a building that was, you know, opened – in the early 2000s. So there's some dated uh, essence to this. There's a, there's a component of it that says this is, this is an older building, relatively speaking, to the NFL. And there are space limitations. We are in the city of Philadelphia, in South Philadelphia specifically. So it's not like this sprawling campus. So there's some real, uh, I guess, confinements that you kind of had to work from. Can you take us through, Tom, some of the specific actions that you you know that have been put in place to keep players and coaches and everybody socially distanced and safe. Yeah, you know, I think the first thing that you would notice if you were to walk around right now is there's a lot of signage. There's a lot of signage all over the place as far as physical distancing measures, um, directional. If if we can have two different hallways, go one going one way, one going an opposite way. Um, you know everything about just how to follow the CDC guidelines, make sure if you're wearing your PPE that you need to do, uh, good hand hygiene, 
Um, and, and then there's a lot of other physical changes that have happened too. Things that if you've been in the building before would be different. Uh, meeting rooms have been knocked down and made larger. Um, a good portion of the Eagles organization, you know, right now is working virtually. And so we've been able to take over other areas of the, of the facility to be able to expand where we can kind of meet with our players and have the players have more interaction. Um, you know, one of the other bigger things is the cafeteria. It's wide open now, no seating in the cafeteria. Uh, we put up tents on the outside and that's basically just for the players seating and for them to be able to socially distance and eat um, without that. So there, there's a, there has been a lot of physical changes to the building itself on the inside. And, and full disclaimer for everybody listening, I've only been uh, through the outside, through the testing, I've been tested for COVID three times and I've been in my very restricted area in the content area downstairs. So I'm learning as everybody else is learning here, uh, Tom, as you kind of describe what's happening at the Nova Care Complex. I, first question here, specifically, what is the locker room like now? What does the locker room look like? I would say that, uh, you know, in this part, Greg Delamitros, uh, the, the VP of Equipment, has really done a lot of uh, hard work, um, put in a lot of time to try to see what measures we could take uh, and kind of keep it some semblance of the same locker room that they had before. Uh, the lockers are spaced out. We're using every other locker. Um, there is a row of lockers in the middle, but uh, every chair, every locker is at least seven feet apart. Um, we've had to take over the player's lounge area and, and take all of those items that are out of that to utilize that space as well to bring in extra lockers uh, so that we could actually fit all of our players into the locker room as opposed to having to do a whole separate tent on the outside for, you know, some of the players, but some of the players being on the inside. And so um, hats off to, to Greg because he's really kind of, put that together and, and thought that process out. Connected to the locker room, the shower room, and the bathroom, uh, have, have they also been remodeled? So, you know, not really like what you would think of a, a brand new bathroom, but they they have been, you know, signage up. We have uh, followed some of, some of the infectious disease control companies, uh, guidelines, um, there's, there's no longer per, uh, mass toiletries that are out there. Everybody has been given their own toiletry bag, again, from Greg, all of their own personal toiletries. Uh, there's, so there's not multiple use by multiple people. Um, you know, the plans are to have everything to be as automatic as possible, you know, whether it's from, from faucets at, at, at one point and, and uh, automatic dispensers as well. And so, Tom, also, as you came in, the Eagles also – Bringing in Ted Rath to oversee the strength and conditioning side of things. Uh, what are the rules in the weight room? Uh, what, how, 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 how's it going to work with all these players? In, it's a gorgeous space, 9,000 square feet, but how will it work for the players? How do you keep them socially distanced there? Yeah, I mean, that's always tough. And so we do have some guidance from the league as far as protocols. You know, there, there's a certain number of, of individuals, depending on your square footage, that can be working out at one time uh, in order to kind of maintain our ability to work out the, the players with the, in the time frames and the constraints that we have. Uh, they, they basically, they've taken down two windows that look out to the field. They've made them into temporary doors. Um, we've got a, a very large weight room tent that has almost two separate weight rooms um, to the left and to the right. And so, you know, Ted's done a great job of really kind of honing in, okay, how can we make this work if we have to have these pop-up weight rooms, if we have to have individuals like a, you know, offense split into three groups in order to kind of socially distance, um, you know, the cleaning things that have to, protocols that have to be done in between every set, wiping down the barbells, wiping down all of that. So, you know, Ted has, has put a, a ton of work as well. Uh, he's been awesome to work with, and uh, I know he's got that, you know, as, as safe and as environment as going to be possible. Wow, that is that is crazy. What what about the you mentioned earlier the the weight the, the uh, meeting rooms. What are the rules for team meetings and position specific meetings? You know, the biggest thing is just going to be about proper education for the players, you know, and the coaches. You know, these meetings is and that's the hand hygiene, that's the PPE, continually wearing the mask. Um, and that is the social distancing. 
So, you know, any space that they're going to be in, especially for longer periods of time, you know, not just walking past each other, it's very important to continue with these guidelines from the CDC. So keeping at least six foot uh, of space. And so uh, the meeting rooms, some of the meeting rooms, you know, met those requirements for the, the roster size of a training camp and, and some didn't. And so they, they have definitely made the changes to the facility to be able to incorporate meetings of our positions throughout the year. Um, there's also been, uh, you know, the decision being made that we will do some of our meetings during training camp once we're at full uh, bore with our roster size, just because of how many players we have, um, you know, over at the Lincoln Financial Field, because it just offers us a much larger space to be able to adequately social distance. Tom, you mentioned masks. Do players and coaches and everybody in the building, you have to wear your mask, no questions asked, mandatory while you are in the building, while you're inside? Absolutely. It's, it's mandatory from the, from the time that you really walk, uh, wear my mask up to the point of, of where I screen and come in, and I take a new mask, and that's the mask that I wear inside the facility. Uh, masked at all times, uh, no excuses, no exceptions. Uh, absolutely a must. Players get tested every day? Yeah, so right now the testing protocol um, is that the players will have to have two two negative tests, uh, and not just players, staff, all tiers, everybody, and that yep. we will uh, to come into the facility. And then once we're in the facility, as of right now, is that we are going to be doing a, a daily test. Okay. Take me through the experience, Tom. A player parks his car at the NovaCare complex, or maybe maybe he pulls into the parking lot and then goes through the testing first. Like, can you do you have a kind of a, a routine that every player is going to go through from the time they go through the the guardhouse to the time they leave? Yeah, I think it's it's uh it's going to start really before they even enter the facility. And so what happens is is we've got a uh, an app that's going to be, that's pushed out to everybody as an alert before they come to the facility. And that's going to go take you through a screening questionnaire. And that screening questionnaire, uh, if you answer correctly, is going to give you a QRC code that you use to scan in to get to the facility. If you don't answer the questions, if there is something that pings, that then my staff uh, will be the one to contact that person to make sure that everything is medically okay and to kind of steer them in the direction that they need to go. So once you come into the parking lot, you're going to see that we have a big white pop-up drive through tent station. And so everybody coming in for a daily test, they'll come up, they'll enter into that tent, uh, go through the nasal swab PCR test. Uh, it takes two minutes. The, the crew from Bioreference Lab has been fantastic. They've been so great to work with. Uh, and they, it's been a phenomenal process so far this week because we've been kind of getting up and running and getting everybody tested. And then once, you, once you've done that, you park your car, you walk up, and you, you'll start to notice uh, these other white tents by the entrances. And we've kind of separated it out, player entrance, tier one and two entrance, tier three entrance. And at those entrances, you scan your QRC code uh, for your screening, and then you'll stand in front of a thermal, uh, thermal camera that will give you your temperature. And if your temperature is below the 100.4, uh, you, and you have the QRC code, you can enter the building. Uh, everything is touchless, automated. And then as you go into the facility, the next thing you have to pick up is this uh, Connexon contact tracer uh, that will kind of alert us for proximity events. And then you get on your way. You actually get started like a normal day. Okay. And obviously, I mean, I, obviously, I mean I've got to believe this, Tom, the work you put in, there's a high level of confidence in everything that you've put in place at the NovaCare complex. I mean, can you kind of speak to that, what the experience has been like for you and, and your level of confidence in the safeguards that are in place? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I've had a high level of confidence, you know, confidence for sure. Uh, as the medical staff, you know, we've been in there uh, throughout this entire time taking care of the individuals that we needed to take care of uh, because unfortunately, those who had surgery, uh, those who are injured, they, that doesn't kind of go away. And so, we, you know, we've seen these protocols, these measures all develop as the organization has kind of vetted different processes, has looked at the science, and has, has followed the CDC guidelines. And, and I can say with extreme confidence that I'm very proud of, of being a part of the team and, and being a part of that and getting it up and running. And uh, absolutely, I feel that our facility 
and what we're going to offer our staff and our players, it, it's safer than any other place that they, they could be. For the fans who are listening, so I'm Tier 3, players, coaches, Tier 1, support staff who are going to be close to the players are Tier 2. Is that how it's going to work? Yeah, so it's designated by tiers. You know, players are, are considered Tier 1, and it's all designated off of the player, really. So, you know, Tier 1 individuals are coaches and staff members, such as myself, uh, some equipment, the weight room staff, uh, because we have – really high contact with the players, right? We're around them. We're in the same spaces. Um, you know, I don't, I don't go to where the players are, you know, the, our space is the same. And so we are all considered a, what was considered a tier one. A tier two is somebody that has interaction with the players or other tier one individuals, but it's on a more of a limited basis, right? So somebody who doesn't have to be down in the locker room, who doesn't have to be in the weight room, who doesn't have to be in the athletic training room, but we'll be around, we'll be on the field. And so they, they're just limited interactions. And that's what designates to a tier two. And then tier three, tier three is an individual who doesn't need access to the player face to face. And that tier three individual is also going to be restricted from the areas of tier one and tier two. So tier one, tier two have full access to the restricted areas. Um, and the tier three are in the non-restricted areas. Right, and for me, I can do my work and not have to be right on top of a player. I can interview Coach Doug or any of the players from different studios that we've set up, so that is all good. Hey, hey Tom, what do you think the players need to do on a daily basis to stay as risk-free as possible? You know, I think the biggest thing is, is just educating everybody. It's players, all of us. It's, it's just following the CDC guidelines, following the science, following the data that's out there. And so one of the way, main ways that we can keep ourselves safe, our staff safe, our families safe, is really to just continue to follow the, the physical distancing measures, to continue to follow the use of, of a mask. You know, for us, we call it PPE, but um, out in the public, it's just a cloth mask. Uh, to continue to follow good hygiene, I mean, you know, washing your hands, coughing into a sleeve, you know, sneezing into a sleeve, not out into the air, uh, making sure that you're washing hands correctly. Uh, it's, it's amazing that when, when this happened, the videos that came out to show, you know, like, how you wash your hands. And I, I mean, I really don't think that 90% of the population washed their hands like that unless you were going into surgery. So I, that's just the main things that they need to do, um, that I need to do, and that everybody else Got a couple more for you, Tom. Um, how about uh, the training room? How do you keep the training room disinfected? Yeah, it's a constant process for us. It's a constant process. So we've done a lot of the physical distancing measures as we can with the, with the treatment tables and the, and the rehab space. Um, you know, but whenever we have an athlete that's going to utilize a modality or utilize a table or utilize you know a piece of rehab equipment, it's just a it, you have to be on the cleaning process right afterwards, right? So if somebody uses one thing, it gets cleaned and put on the table. We'll use, you know, change the paper out after each individual, also wipe down the table. Um, so all these things, it's just a constant, constant being uh, cognizant of what needs to be done to just kind of protect our athletes and protect ourselves. And then at the end, just like the rest of the facility, um, you know, we use an electrostatic sprayer with a disinfectant to really make sure that it's adhering to all the surfaces and, and disinfecting the entire room. Uh, you mentioned the cafeteria, Tom. Are players allowed to eat in the cafeteria or are they encouraged to grab and go? So it is, it's a little bit different. It's like grab and go. However, the uh, cafeteria space has been really kind of segmented to, as a line so that they could socially distance as they have to wind through to grab everything they need. And so instead, all the seating has been moved to outdoor climate controlled tents uh, that allows them to each have their own place to sit and still be six feet away from the next person. So, um, and, that, and those tents are really dedicated to just the players. For us, for the staff, what we'll do is, you know, I'll go down, I'll grab my lunch, and I will bring it back to my own office to eat. Wow. That is, I mean, I, I this is all, this is, understand for everybody, this is all new to me too because I have not been permitted to see 
uh, what this the Novacare complex. Tom, it sounds like the whole place has been completely remodeled. Yes, and, and uh, you know the, the facility, Ryan Hummels and his facility crew, and, and all all the guys that that do all those things. I mean, I, I, they have been working tirelessly to get this up and running. Um, it, it is not an easy thing to plan, coordinate, and then actually physically do. And, uh, you know, hats off to, to everybody on that crew. It's awesome. A couple more. What, what happens if a player feels sick during the day? You know, if they, if they feel sick during the day, what's going to happen is the medical staff is going to be notified, you know, and then we, we just kind of activate what the NFL, NFLPA uh, protocol is going to be. And so really – what we'll do is we'll isolate them out. We've got a tent that's outside of the facility so we can get them out of uh, that enclosed space as soon as possible. You know, we'll be in our, our PPE to protect ourselves, put the athlete in a mask. And then from there, it's just a matter of finding out what the symptoms are, you know, contacting our physicians, uh, you know, having them guide us into the next step, get them tested as we need to get tested, and, and really truly get them isolated and away from the facility uh, back at home. And then, you know, as, as we're going along, it's just a matter of continuing to provide the medical care as necessary, you know, monitoring the progression, whether, whether they do have COVID or whether they have another illness. Uh, and, and just going through all the protocols that we need to, to make sure that they're safe and the rest of the facility staff players are safe as well. I would imagine also how the sidelines are going to look for practice. Is that already an established protocols you have a sense of what that's going to look like at the Novacare complex like do you socially distance when guys actually aren't on the field taking a rep yeah we have to try to be cognizant of, of what we can do when we can do it right so um, obviously when you're out in the field and you're lined up in formation and you're about to run a play um you know you, you can't stand six feet apart but you know for the times that you're not out there we can and so that's going to be on us to just kind of keep that in everybody's head, become part of the norm. You know, we've done a lot of changes, at least for myself on the medical staff, is what I can really tell you about. And that's, uh, you know, for these players' safety, is there's, there's no longer shared water sources. They're, they each had their own individual water bottle. Um, they each, there's like single-use towels. So once a player uses it one time, it gets put right into a bin that will go, you know, and just get laundered. Um, there's no sharing of towels anymore. And, and there's just a, a, a lot of other uh, things that we are doing to try to keep them as safe as possible. How about using Lincoln Financial Field? I, I know that you can't speak to what Doug wants to do in terms of necessarily practicing over there, but has that also been remodeled um, from the sense of the locker rooms and taking advantage of Temple's locker room, for example, and, and making that a space that the team can use to create more physical distancing? Yeah, you know, like Coach with uh, John Ferrari and, and Greg Delamitros and, and Pat Dolan, they, they've done a really good job of, of just how do we attack it with if, if we can't physically do it in our facility, you know, how can we use the Lincoln financial field? And so, you know, I don't, I don't have as many of the details and the process that went into that, um, but, but I know that they've, they've, we've got the plan. I know that we're ready to use it, and, and they've really, really come up with a great plan of action. Tom, the other part of this is that these players, when they're done at the Novacare Complex, they're going to go home to their families. Uh, some of them have friends that they room with in their apartments or their condos or whatever they live. Uh, how do you communicate to those people about making sure that everybody is behaving themselves away from the Novacare Complex, away from Lincoln Financial Field? Yeah, you know what, I think it's just really important, again, the education part, and, and what are our goals, and what are, what are, what's our mission, what do we set out to do? Um, and, and I think for, for myself, for my staff, and for our room, you know, we want to provide the best medical care that we can, and we want to help the team to win a championship. And so, you know, my attitude is that everything that I'm going to do is going to be focused around those two goals. And when I go home, I don't want to do anything just because I'm home that jeopardizes those goals. And I think it's, it's going to just be a bigger burden upon everybody to realize the situation that we're in is not normal. It's not normal life. And if, if, if I have to look out for my health, I also have to look out for the health of those 80 guys that are coming in or 90 guys that are coming into training camp for my coaches. Um, my decisions affect them. My decisions of what I do in my own personal time in this case, with this pandemic, 
do affect the others that are around me. And so it's just going to be really important to drive that point home. You know, we're all in this together. It's about a team. It's about being together. It's about getting through this together uh, and getting through this together better than anybody else. Tom, last one for me, and then if, you, if I've missed anything, please add. And this is probably a dumb question, but I've asked plenty of those in the past, and I hope we'll <laughs> ask many more dumb questions in the future. Uh, what about a mask or a shield or something on the field? Does that encourage, uh, have players express that maybe they want to wear that stuff? I mean, what, is the, what is your thought on that? You know, my thought is that at any time that we can continue the use of PPE, um, it is going to be beneficial in trying to mitigate the risk. Uh, I know as far as myself and other staff members, like we will be wearing a mask on the field, even though it's outside, it's, it will, we'll still be wearing a mask. Um, you know, for, for some of our coaches, uh, I, I believe that it, they'll be able to do it. Um, they may, some may want to transition to more of a face shield and, and not a mask, um, you know, in the heat. And I think for the players, it becomes difficult, right? The players are really physically exerting themselves. And so um, for them, it's, it's not quite as easy. I, I know there are players who may try to have some sort of solution. I know the league is trying in cooperation with, with many different companies, uh, Under Armour, Oakley, New Air. Like there's a whole bunch of host of things that they are trying to come up with, um, you know, for masks. And so we don't have like, the definitive answer that this is exactly what every person will be doing. Uh, I can tell you that those who are not players, uh, again, are, are encouraged to use the mask so that we can keep everybody safe as possible. Anything that you want to add that, that you can kind of paint the picture that kind of wraps this whole thing up is as far as what this massive endeavor that not only the Philadelphia Eagles, but every team in the NFL are going through. Have I covered everything or is there something that I'm missing? You know, I don't know that you're missing anything. I think just the biggest key is just to talk about that this is a, uh, a joint effort. It's been a joint effort from the beginning as far as um, all of us coming together and, and as a team to get this organized, to get the facility up and running, to get the protocols in place. And, you know, that's just going to continue. It's, it's going to be a team effort with the players, with the coaches, and with everybody to continue the safety of everybody and, you know, to get done what we need to get done uh, to have a successful football season. Yeah, you know, you really it has to be a 100% buy-in or this is not going to work. I mean, that's kind of the message, right? Like everybody has to think about not only themselves, but everyone else to make sure that this thing goes off safely and then we can all enjoy a great Philadelphia Eagles season. Absolutely. Tom, I want to thank you so much uh, for all the great work you've done and for spending time here on the Eagles Insider Podcast. Best of luck to you, and uh, let's make this happen. I appreciate it, Dave. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Tom. And thanks to Tom Hunkley for giving us that audio tour of the NovaCare Complex. Now, let's talk about some of the new rules in place for Training Camp 2020. Serious XM NFL insider Adam Kaplan joining me here, Adam. Good to have you and good to be talking football, which is right here. How you doing, buddy? Good to talk to you. Yeah, David, it's exciting. We, we get to talk about football and, and that it's on a horizon here for training camp. Training camp, obviously, Dave, as you well know, will be much different uh, than we've seen before. But as you said, we've got football. Yeah, so let's go through it here. Okay, let's talk first about roster sizes. Teams are able to cut down to 80 players prior to Tuesday when the veterans report, or they can make those cuts between that reporting date and August 16th, the last day before padded practices can begin. Adam, what kind of impact will this have on teams as they, you know, always look to find that gem who wasn't drafted, who comes from nowhere, and who invariably makes the team? Yeah, it's going to be harder. You know, the, the Corey Clement kind of finds that the Eagles had in 2017, the so-called Super Bowl hero. It's going to be harder. Just talking to, to a lot of coaches, positional coaches in particular, the last couple of weeks, and when they were aware that the rosters were pretty certain to go down from 90 to 80, uh, look, they made it very clear. It's it, when you don't have players in the off season uh, and you don't have exposure to them, knowing exactly what they can do and what they can't do, it makes it harder. You're probably going to lean more on veterans. So it's, it's just, it's, un, it's, it's unfortunate. Uh, it, you know, it is what it is, so to speak, but uh, hopefully, hopefully though, before we get out of August, every team will find one or two gems, but th to be honest, Dave, it's going to be much, much harder for coaches to find those guys. 
players are able to opt out of the season. We've already seen one player do that. Uh, the details are irrevocable and due seven days from this deal being finalized. So uh, there are two different opt-out options. Can you explain the high risk? versus the voluntary. Yeah, so what they're using for high risk is high risk is defined by the CDC. And if you if you fit in that realm, you get a little bit of a high if you opt out, you get a little bit of higher stipend, but you're not going to get your full base salary. That that and then with which the with the uh not not a serious one, the money is less uh that you would get if you do opt out. And again, they as we've seen in other sports, you do have that option and you were talking about Laurent Duvernay Tardif, the doctor, the chief starting guard, who's also a doctor, and uh, he's doing a great thing here. He's, he wants to continue to treat patients, and he's, he's decided not to play this season. Right, and the two uh, levels of uh, offset are, or rather stipends, are three hundred fifty thousand yep. dollars for the high risk, one hundred fifty thousand dollars salary advance for the voluntary. No accrued season for the latter, and accrued credited season for the former. Practice squads, interesting, Adam, 16-man practice squads. We saw, obviously, how important the practice squad was for the Eagles in 2019. And then there are six of those players who can have an unlimited number of accrued seasons. So the practice squad is not only a developmental part of your team, but an emergency. Get them up and play. They are experienced players if you need them in the course of the season. Right, correct. And as David, as you well know, over the years the practice squad rules have changed. You, you, once in a while, you'll see a guy's been in the league three times, three years, but still was able to qualify to be on the practice squad. So yeah, mo- this year more than more than ever, I'm expecting clubs to rely on the practice squad, particularly if we have a COVID breakout in in a building where you you might be down six or seven players. Well, you go to your practice squad. Uh, now, one thing I do want to mention, uh, getting back to roster size. On August 16th, they, every team must be down to 80 players, and then the next one, the next, the, the only real cut down will be to 53, just like we've seen in years past, where you go from 90 to 53. Uh, so, and that will be obviously the uh, the opening week of the season. So it's not like they have to make this ra- this drastic roster change. It's just 10 players, and again, as we just discussed, they don't have to do that now. But all teams must be down to 80 by August 16th. Adam, we'll talk about the no preseason in just a moment. Salary cap for next season can drop no lower than $175 million, still significantly lower. Uh, If revenues are better than expected, that number could be higher. Certainly puts a premium on planning for the future. Don't want to talk specifically about the Eagles, but we've seen reports of how, how tight, or actually how over the cap the Eagles are. What is this going to mean for front offices, Adam? It's going to be more challenging because you have a salary cap projection that you do uh, each year for, uh, from a front, front office standpoint. And then when this thing, situation hits, you have to quarter, sort of revise your strategy. You always have the ability to extend contracts. You can restructure contracts. You could ask players for a pay cut if they, you think that uh, they need to take one. So there are some options. And you're right. There, when you go around the league with all 32 teams, it's going to be a little bit, it's little, going to be a little bit more impactful, but that just takes a little bit more of a challenge. It's not like when we talk about the Eagles, they haven't been through challenges before. Every team has. You just have to have a good structure, and I think the Eagles, with their contracts, have done a really good job of understanding what needs to get done. And then, Adam, let's talk about padded practices. 14 padded practices in total beginning August 17th. Between now and then, strength and conditioning work, work on the field with no pads, um, obviously a huge difference here. How will that impact when the regular season begins? The quality of play with combination of no preseason, quality of play in the regular season. Yeah, so Dave, I talked to a personnel director who was with another team in 2011, obviously nine years ago, coming out of lockout, and he said that, he thought, based on what he could recall, the level of play was, and the quote was not what I what we expected in August. It didn't look like quote what it should look like until week three to week four to the regular season. Now, remember, coming out of lockout in eleven, they did have preseason games. They didn't have an off season. Rookies didn't have the playbook in the off season. But the other thing is, Dave, we have to also see as we get players in here what kind of physical shape they're in. Remember, in twenty eleven, Dave. The players could work out on their own. 
Here, you, you can, but you have to do it on a rules depending on what your state mandates. So it's going to be a little bit harder. And then you talk about the, the two weeks of, of padded practice. It'll help, obviously. It'll, any practice time is going to help. And getting used to being in pads again, that's what coaches have always told me. It's not so much the action, it's so much the mindset of getting back, getting your mind ready, because the season will be upon them three weeks after they start practicing, which is not ideal. But coaches, as you know, Dave, you've been around them your entire career with the Eagles. They are very, very resilient. It's interesting, Adam. You know, not until day seven are players able to – begin their strength and conditioning work and they at that time have eight days with sessions limited to 60 minutes in the weight room and 60 minutes of aerobic conditioning coaches permitted to lead an hour-long walkthrough on those eight days followed by four days of unpadded practices where players wear shells and helmets and then and only then the 14 padded practices begin so a new world obviously it's all about safety Let's get to the regular season, Adam. And, uh, you know, to me, as we finish it up here, the teams that are most prepared, that maximize their time on and off the field the best, and in the case of the Eagles, to me, you've got a returning coaching staff, a lot of key players in place. That helps the transition. Those are the teams that will have the most success. Do you agree with that? Yeah, you can't underestimate the the, the clubs that have a returning coaching staff. Now, the Eagles obviously – most of them return, and we, the Eagles also have added some new coaches, particularly on offense, a couple on defense. But when you have the majority of your coaching staff returning in a situation like this without an offseason, without, without a preseason, you have an advantage. There's no question about it. Now, now, you know, people keep saying, well, everyone's got the same advantage. Not quite if you're not bringing the same guys back. Because remember, let, let, let's look at the NFC East quickly here, Dave. You've got three new head coaches. You, when you haven't had these guys in your off-season program, you it, it, you don't don't know these players well enough. They've not been in your building, and the Eagles know their they know this roster. I and mean, it, it's just a major advantage. But how much of an advantage it it is remains to be seen. It is the new normal. We're looking forward to it. We've got football here at the Novacare Complex. Adam Kaplan, NFL Insider. Keep up the great work, and thank you so much for joining the Eagles Insider Podcast, presented by Lincoln Financial Group. Thank you. And that'll do it for this Eagles Insider Podcast presented by Lincoln Financial Group. Thanks to Ray Doyle and Peter Kelly for putting it all together. Thanks to all of you for joining. Make sure you drop us a review. Those five-star reviews certainly do help. There's a link in the details section of your library. I'm Eagles Insider Dave Spadaro. Thanks for joining, everyone. Have yourselves a great Eagles day, and fly, Eagles, fly. E-A-T-L-E-S, Eagles!